Okay, good evening, dear friends. Um, I have two news, as usually, in the end of the year. One is not bad, but a bit sad, but because it's a last lecture of this year, open lecture series, but I have a good news as well. Thanks for the culture and endowment and uh, uh, the Faculty of Architecture of Estonian Academy of Arts. We will continue next year as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm very glad to um, introduce our uh, today's lecture, Lydia Kalipolitim. Lydia is an architect, engineer, and uh, a scholar who research focuses on the intersections of architecture, technology, and environmental politics. She's an assistant professor at the Cooper Union in New York. She has also taught uh, at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where she directed the Master of Science program, and at Syracuse University, Columbia University, and Pratt Institute as well. Lydia holds a diploma in architecture and engineering from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and a Master of Science in Design and Building Technology from MIT, and PhD in History and Theory of architecture from Princeton University. Her work has been published and exhibited widely, including the Venice Biennale, the Istanbul Design Biennale, Shenzhen Biennale, the Onassis Culture Center, the Royal Ac Academy of British Architecture, and the Storefront in New York. She's author of the awarded book, The Architecture of Closed Worlds, or What is Power of Shit? Uh, published in 2018, The History of Ecological Design for Oxford English Encyclopedia of Environmental Science, and she's editor of Exoredux, uh, a special issue of Architecture Design magazine in 2010. She's the principal of NANA Cycle Think Tank, which has been named leading innovator in sustainable design in Bill's 2019 awards. Please join me welcoming Lydia Kalipoliti. Hello, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much for um, the invitation, um, especially to uh, Johan and Sile that uh, have curated these events. Um, and I hope I get a chance to see your work tomorrow and um, a little bit of Tallinn. Um, so I'm here to speak about this recent book, which is a little bit more than a book. It was a kind of all-consuming project um, that I have examined um, in different mediums. And uh, the title, as was mentioned, uh, is The Architecture of Closed Worlds, which is a title that references um, a kind of um, important book by Rainer Banham in 1969, The Architecture of Well-Tempered Environment, and that gives it a legitimate legacy in documenting the history of environmental technology. But also, I decided to use a kind of uglier and a little bit um, less accepted or less legitimate subtitle, or What is the Power of Shit, um, which... Um, you know, it's, it's ugly because it's to your face, but it does make you wonder what are the consequences of our actions? What is the raw, visceral um, kind of side of environmental concerns? And um, kind of a forecast on how possibly the way that we produce um, and the way that we operate um, in the world, our shit may come back to bite us at some point. Our waste is already coming back to uh, to us in different ways um, through uh, manifestations of climate change, including the Pacific Gyre um, and other things that I'm going to talk about today. So I'll start with a question. What, what is a closed world? And I have not invented that term. Actually, um, um, historian of, of science Paul Edwards uh, wrote a book called The Closed World um, and used this term to, uh, to narrate to account for the history of computing in Cold War America to really explain the operation of feedback loops in computer programs and the way that they would cycle back into themselves. Uh, but also, he examined the, the term uh, quite theoretically, and he wrote at some point that a closed world is radically divided against itself. 
turned inexorably inward, without frontiers or escape, a closed world threatens to annihilate itself, to implode from the inside. So I'm, even though he's speaking about the idea of closure as an operational medium, as a, as a kind of feedback loop, uh, as an idea of a cycle, um, I'm examining in the book um, a kind of parallel but divergent history, a genealogy of contained microcosms with the ambition to replicate the Earth in its totality, a series of living experiments that forge what I tentatively call a synthetic naturalism where the laws of nature and metabolism are displaced from the domain of wilderness to the domain of cities and buildings. And this is nothing new, right? The idea of encapsulating a piece of nature um, in a sealed medium is nothing new to architects. Um, you see here um, a very tiny art project by the experimental Viennese group House Record Co. It was originally exhibited in uh, Vienna in an art fair, in, a, in, in Cologne actually, in an art fair in 1973, and then was published at the cover of Casabella, a piece of nature. Um, but, but in fact, what's interesting about it is that, you know, Logier's primitive hut is inside this. It really documents the end of nature, the idea that, you know, this, this piece of, of wilderness has to be sealed and closed and replicated through technological instrumentation. So it is a fossil of a lost idea of what nature might have been. But in fact, the role of the reconstruction of idealized microcosm microcosms is very tied to the history of utopia. And here we see a very famous image, but Minister Fuller's and Soji Sadao's dome over Manhattan um, in 1960. We can also recall Rainer Banham's environmental bubble along the same time. These examples that really delineate a perimeter uh, where something vital is captured uh, inside, something that is threatened from what is outside, are iconic illustrations because they are delivered in a period of intense environmental anxiety in the 60s, right at the point where the whole earth was discovered and viewed from the whole of mankind from outside, and we were just zooming in. Um, and they manifest kind of like jarred fossils, like the previous example, our lost idea of the untamed land. And if you think about it, our canonical understanding of utopia, you see here, let's say, the utopia, Claude Nicolas Ledoux Saltworks, 19th century concept, is very close to the idealization of a closed system, a self-sustaining environment that is clearly demarcated from its surroundings by a boundary that does not allow for the transfer of matter and energy. So in the post-war period, the idea of utopia is reenacted through whole earth systems. The recirculation of resources in the global ecosystem was idealized in the possibility of circularity and containment in a number of projects that proliferated following the war. In this sense, closed systems are not only key sites of engineering and environmental production, but also materialize a utopian project to temper and fabricate the environment as a site of architectural production. However, closed worlds are, not are no longer poetic metaphors for lost utopias. They have become profitably real. And of course, in the screen, you see Jacques Tati's Playtime, a kind of iconic uh, movie um, in 1976. But it represents the idea of interiorization, of the office interior, our life indoors. We spent 90% of our life indoors. And today, if you think of indoor environments, uh, they're not neutral spaces. They're, in fact, politically charged spaces that reflect social ideals and culturally specific standards of taste and judgment confined, as we all are, within artificial enclosures, environmental control has enforced for us all biased standards of life, even though in most cases these standards institutionalize absurd criteria that homogenize ideas of comfort and well-being for the entirety of the human race, for all of us at once. So in many ways, Closed worlds are power structures that maintain and manage constancy over bodies and psyches. 
the establishment of this uh, questionable medium, uh, thermal equilibriums in interior spaces since the 1950s, sequestered comfort zones held within narrow ranges. This is comfort here. So I don't know if anybody knows about environmental control. Uh, this is uh, temperature. This is humidity. Uh, these are other factors. This is enthalpy, for example, dry bulb temperature. And only in this space we are comfortable within an interior space. 90% uh, of indoor environments in corporate office buildings, um, at least in America, but I think you know all over the world, maybe they differ very, very slightly, are regulated automatically to keep these levels intact. So the, the holding of these comfort zones within narrow ranges reflects an understanding of the body as a tool in a constant atmospheric medium in order to control and predict its behavior and growth. It is precisely this mechanical vision of biology that gives life specifically a modern character. If organisms, either people or plants, are examined explicitly as mechanical structures serving a physical equilibrium, one cannot account for the complexity, but neither for the beauty of life. So in the book, I argue that the history of 20th century architecture, design, and engineering has been strongly linked to the conceptualization and production of closed systems. As partial reconstructions of the world in time and in space, closed systems speak of the transference of life using architecture as a medium and a vessel to secure the cycling of matter, energy, data, and capital. The projects that I'm documenting represent entirely different antithetical political agendas. Some of them are military experiments, others are countercultural practices, um, and they range from the nostalgia of the homesteading movement to, more recently, the dubious concept of ecological tourism and environmental capitalism. And yes, this is a real term. In every case, these systems are real and invested in the strangeness of the real. They are not, they're experimentally implemented and they're not speculative. So how does one write this kind of nonlinear history was a question that I had while writing the book. And it was a very important one. Uh, uh, and the way that, I, that I've decided to go about it was instead from a linear text, which is 90% of, of any uh, format uh, that we have in books, I examine, in this case, redesign and reimagine an archive. An archive, which is not a static object that contains historical documents, but an immersive space and a living collection where existential ideas about world orders migrate through different architectural and spatial typologies. Contrary to a linear text, a reconfigured archive allows multiplicity, simultaneity, and disruption. It allows the reader to travel between different times, places, and objects of investigation, enabling multiple connections and complex affinities between themes, concepts, ideas that are not limited to a single place, era, author, and type. A reconfigured archive can thus produce new interconnected categories out of existing ones a universe of multitudes that does not necessarily need to be transcribed in linear time. I see the use of history as a creative and generative medium for contemporary concerns in design education and practice, one that does not only promote public engagement with historical material, but also makes evident that in the history of ideas, discourses get recycled. Materials in closed systems are not the only items that are being recycled. Concepts emerge as allegedly new, but ideas go through long journeys of migration from one epistemological field to another. Contrary to a building, a drawing, or a book, the archive and the database is a distinctive disciplinary category of an architectural object that empowers, possibly, new forms of authorship based on the extru extrusion of evidence to an event lingering between reality and fiction. An example I use to conceptualize time is the history of large-scale galaxies. As far as we know, when we observe a distant galaxy, we see it as it was when light has left it, not as it is today. So our understanding of the universe is perplexing and partial at best, 
since the only thing that we actually have is a form of time machine, one that allows us to see the past through investigation and observation. Some people doubt whether we can ever know what the universe was like billions of years ago. Actually, the real problem is knowing what it is like right now. I find this cosmological metaphor quite empowering because it implies the end of history as a knowledge of the present looking into the past. It offers an alternative reading of architectural history as a reconstruction project of what may be selectively illuminated out of an archive of historical objects, let's say, in order to fabricate multiple versions of present states based on fragments of, of the past. But to witness the journey of this ideological migration that I am, that I am referring to here, um, I will showcase three case studies analyzed in, in the book and extract points for a manifesto on why I'm using the term, the power of shit. <coughs> and I will start by a very obvious example, the most famous and prolific and notorious, actually, closed world ever constructed, the Biosphere 2 in Arizona, in Oracle, um, which was constructed and sealed in 1991. Um, and um, you see here um, the kind of facility. It does remain the largest and most famous closed ecological system ever built. And its purpose was to test the viability of biologically regenerative artificial environments that would support human habitation in space and provide a prototype Earth colony in case the Earth would be destroyed. It was built by a company self-proclaimed self, uh, Space Biospheres Venture, a partnership between Ed Bass, who was a businessman and a philanthropist, and spent approximately $200 million to build and sustain the facility, and John Allen, who was a systems ecologist and environmentalist that had the idea to construct this project. Biosphere 2 supported two missions, with the first team of researchers entering the facility in 1991, locked from the exterior world for two years and 20 minutes. The team produced their own food and air supply within a heavily sequestered series of ecosystems. During the entire experiment, all of the crew's waste, including waste from their domesticated animals, was recycled through natural low-tech filtration methods. Biosphere 2, you're probably wondering, why am I showing you that? You'll just wait, hold on for one second. It's very famous because it failed fa spectacularly and very publicly. The first mission was notorious for technical and operational failures, especially for not creating enough oxygen. There were a lot of theories about why there was not enough oxygen and extra oxygen had to be pumped. One was that the concrete was curing and the curing process of concrete was eating up um, the, the oxygen, and that was something, the kind of side effect or byproduct of a material formation was not something that was calculated within the mathematical formulas um, and the flow charts, the engineering flow charts of the biosphere. Another theory was that soil decomposition also eats up more oxygen, um, but um, independently of that, um, after six months, oxygen absorption by raw concrete was still curing depleted oxygen levels in the facility by 6%. Along with poor interior air quality, unanticipated species like cockroaches and this crazy ant, the tawny crazy ant, thrived and were ubiquitous inside the world of the biosphere. Also, the biospherians suffered from hunger throughout the two years of their residency. This is a biospherian walking in and out of the biosphere, losing about 13% of his body mass. The second mission was infamous for mutiny and public feuds among different stakeholders that were involved in the facility's management. In time, what had happened was that John Allen, who is the guy you see on the screen, who was, let's say, the so-called philosopher scientist, started arguing very intensely with Ed Bass, who was the person that was financing the project. The latter camp claimed that Allen and his synergist were destroying the credibility of the project, and Bass took action in hiring the now controversial white nationalist Stephen Bannon to run Space Biosphere's ventures. 
The involvement of Bannon, who was at this time manager of Bannon and Co. Investment Banking in Beverly Hills, was detrimental. With Bass and Ban Bannon's endorsement, the second team of biospherians who entered the facility in 1994 were ambushed by federal marshals. The two men had concluded that the founding management team, including Allen and his cult, the synergists, had to leave. In retaliation, Allen scientists sabotaged the second experiment by opening the airlocks of Biosphere 2, claiming concerns over the health of the inhabitants and were later arrested. The mission was compromised and it ended soon thereafter. Bannon had also an open quarrel with biospherian Abigail Ailing, who was documenting um, the oceans, the uh, kind of manufactured oceans and the ocean life within the biosphere. And their quarrels were originally published in the Tucson Citizen in 1996 and resurfaced in the, in the media during the US presidential elections of 2016. They disclosed a series of threats, insults, and accusations of sexual harassment. Arguably, the closed world's material problems that were evident in the first mission were rendered as social and political problems in the second and final human mission. Both events revealed that the idea of dynamic equilibrium of material exchange in an arbitrarily chosen part of the Earth's biosphere cannot just set in spontaneously as Allen so earnestly desired. Redundancy of species and the logic of inclusiveness did not automatically lead to the cybernetic equilibrium that, was, that everybody wanted. So the battle between Allen and Bass, the one that conceptualized the project and yearned for cybernetic equilibrium and the guy that financed it and wanted the credibility of a scientific project exposes a very important dichotomy in environmental politics. That between the idealization of self-organization and the brutality of Darwinian evolution, which was transposed effortlessly to social order and policy. In many ways, Biosphere 2 exhibits a mythology of consensus based on natural principles and furthers the belief that equilibrium should be translated to social policy and societal values. As a living experiment, the Biosphere 2 demonstrated that the limits of sustainability and the risks associated with closed ecosystems remain largely unknown. So in many years, closed worlds are a form of hysteria. After years of research on self-reliance, Stuart Brand, who was the creator of the Whole Earth Catalog in the 1970s, a very important figure in environmental politics, and somebody who really wanted to make self-reliance, the idea of energy autonomy, work throughout uh, the oil crisis, confessed that energy autonomy was a kind of hysteria. Brand's kinship between the closed system and the hysteric body is critical if we reflect on Freud's definition of hysteria as a physiological internal modification of the nervous system. To describe the symptoms of hysteria, Freud spoke of closure as a type of modification that affects the organism alone instead of one that affects the organism's surroundings. Psychoanalytically, this corresponds to the stage called the protopsyche in psychoanalysis, at which the organism has control over nothing except for itself. Ultimately, it functions like an ad hoc closed system that generates materials out of what is available within the borders of a body. Also, closed worlds has fostered a perception of Earth holding. Closed worlds do not imply that the Earth necessarily wants to be held in our hands. We are not its caretakers. And I'm speaking of a progeny of Earth photographs that have uh, um, been spread after this experiment and after the oil crisis, where the image of the Earth is completely anthropomorphized, held gently and affectionately by human hands, as if it is a wounded creature that needs our care. This anthropomorphic perception of the Earth as an endangered living species that is cute and sentient as a being that needs to be petted by us, its conquerors, is delusional 
as it positions our species at the center of all pivotal planetary developments. Our perception of the Earth as one interconnected world, as an image that promotes unity and balance, is no longer the case. Unilateral strategies for divergent problems in the ideological belief that the metabolism of the planet may become the foundation for technology, culture, and design is no longer applicable. The whole Earth catalog is not so whole anymore, or never was so whole to begin with. So after, I'm, 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 after this project that was a complex venture of substantial capital, uh, which and involved vast resources of experimentation, prototyping, construction, and communication, I will move to a much more modest project, a countercultural urban intervention using minimal resources, the integral urban house that was built in 1974 um, in San Francisco, and um, the idea of digestive autonomy. That house was the project of an underground community group um, called Integral Urban House, and it was a domestic organization in an urban setting envisioned by its founders as a healthy, natural, cyclical system. The project was initiated by Helga and William Olkowski and funded by the nonprofit organization called Farallones Institute, founded by St Sim Vanderin, who was a pioneer, um, who is considered a pioneer in sustainable architecture and was state architect of California. It was, architecturally, it was, it was just a typical house, nothing exceptional there in Berkeley, California, which was retrofitted by the Institute to a highly productive test bed for self-reliance, resource renewal, and recycling of waste materials. What was mostly interesting in that case study was that the house was tied to its inhabitants almost with an umbilical cord. It needed constant maintenance, and the dwellers were completely linked to the house in a very physical way. The ecosystem was linked to a community of stakeholders, each playing a specific role in a larger scheme of actions. According to the founders, it was significant to repeatedly explain an action plan of life to all the members and commit to specific behavioral protocols before coming in to live in the house. This format of habitation brings me to an important point, that the occupant of a closed world is possibly a guinea pig. This is what Buckminster Fuller called himself in his essay, Guinea Pig B, B for Bucky. And he was describing himself as an average human being of 89 years old in a completely physical way, nothing about mental capacity, just as a digestive device of input and output. A guinea pig does not really observe and speculate on possible outcomes. Rather, it is willful to insert its bodily parts into a living experiment. So the closed world dweller is its feeder and its caretaker. He or she monitors it closely and safeguards its operations. And these are some examples in the book. Auguste Picard, a famous French balloonist, who reached the stratosphere in a hermetically sealed aluminum gondola that he designed, almost reaching his death. He, in that little ball, he went up there, and um, he survived by chance because of air currents that landed him in the Alps. Evgeny Shepelev, in the BIOS-3 uh, experiment in 1972, was the first human to remain in a closed system containing only chlorella, which is a type of algae, as the only bioregenerative component that he could eat for 90 days. And British architect Graham Kane, who built the ecological house, this is the diagram of it, uh, rarely left the premises of the house that he built and occupied, otherwise its biotechnical systems would degenerate and die. So while ecological systems of the post-war period portray the inhabitant as an indispensable part of a building economy and ecology, currently this image is a disenfranchised narrative. Environmental concerns promote mostly a conservationist ethic and a list of cautionary daily practices of scarcity. And yet there is nothing more visceral as a participatory spatial experience than the scientist's voluntary containment inside the premises of a closed world. And you see here that the human 
is only a nominal part of the system, not in the center or not as substantially important. The ambition overall of the integral urban house was not to change the system holistically, but to reorient waste as a productive byproduct that fosters different pathways or more possibilities for each cycle of resources. Food production yielded from the management of organic and inorganic waste was key to the integral urban house, as well as to several other domestic experiments at the time that heralded self-reliance from the grid of urban supplies. Making food from excrements was the ultimate aspiration, carried out through tedious, repetitive, and dirty routines like sorting, composting, mixing mulch for vegetation and animal feed crops. With these aims in mind, the space of the house was nurtured and dependent on the subtle fluctuations of material phase changes and the growth of living substances. To achieve these challenging material conversions, the Institute researched on thermophilic bacteria that had the potential to create protein from the waste of livestock and in forming bacteria soups which can break down cellulosic waste into protein for animal feed. This type of research was not only conducted by countercultural groups in the backyards, but also by major industrial stakeholders like General Electric in their ongoing effort to chemically engineer bacteria that perform efficient tasks, to use them as tools, basically, eating toxins found in petroleum. Specifically, this guy, microbiologist Ananda Chakrabarty, who was uh, a genetic engineer that worked for GE in 1972, developed a man-made living organism which combined features of several strains of pseudonomous bacteria that would eat toxins found in petroleum. He attempted to patent the bacteria, and the patent was rejected uh, by the U.S. office, leading to a United States Supreme Court case known as the Diamond versus Chakrabarty case on whether genetically modified organisms could be patented. The court ruled in the scientists' favor, stating that the fact that microorganisms are alive, but this is without of any legal consequences for the purposes of the patent law. The court case, nevertheless, did raise ethical questions as to where life begins and what are the ethics involved in pre-engineering the autonomy of microorganisms. It also silently introduced into the field of designing and building a field of semi-autonomy or disobedience of matter. Now it is a fact that excrements may potentially yield some food and that Graham Kane and the Farallones Institute were not so delusional. Nevertheless, with the introduction of these questions into the field of architecture and design, one inevitably accepts that if ecological houses are in fact digestive machines, they're sometimes disobedient, and this is what autonomy means in many respects. Even though ecosystems are mostly simulated as robust circular systems where waste might equal food in a series of cycles and, uh, and sub-cycles, the idea of self-sufficiency is compulsive and hysteric in the will to constantly regenerate life from waste. Therefore, to write a counter-history to optimized material economies, one needs to look at shit, because only through this raw confrontation may the ecology of life be somehow useful. Shit forces us to look at questions of ecology viscerally, via our bodies and the understanding that recycling is not just a statistical problem which we can relay to the management of urban resources, but also a basic bodily reality that affects the water and the air we breathe. Our unwanted, odorous, and degenerate bodily products have been described in this light as technically powerful and worthy. They can generate methane, meaning power, if treated properly then recycling shit to money is as much a subject of theoretical analysis as a factual constituent of capitalist production. Waste needs to go away, and this very process of purging, transporting, and carrying into oblivion all that is worthless is very profitable for those who manage and transfer the raw materi materials. And this is what I'm talking about. This is 
one an important aspect of that, the handling of shit out of New York to Alabama daily, tons of human waste, excrements that cannot be biofiltrated in the Sewage Creek facility. New York City, the beating heart of global finance and culture, creates an enormous amount of poo. As reporter Oliver Millman wrote for The Guardian, a substantial amount of the city's shit is expelled to Alabama, causing major methane clouds 900 miles away. The treated sewage, euphemistically known in the industry as biosolids, travels by a train to a landfill waste of Birmingham, causing what the locals call the death smell. In Alabama, the avalanche of northern poo is part of a wider concern of environmental risk for residents, particularly for the impoverished and people of color. The dismissal of the environmental concerns of Alabama residents, mostly residents of overwhelmingly African-American communities, has been reported as a case of civil rights and environmental racism. Let us not forget that more than a material, shit also indicates a general state of incoherency, degeneration, and malevolence. It indicates a stage where information is so finely grained and scattered that it cannot form identifiable bonds and patterns. Information, which is shit, as we call it in, in language, is so unrefined and randomly grained that it is interrelational loss or incohesion between bits and particles that defines this degenerate condition. So from shit, we're going to talk about happiness or compulsive happiness. And um, the last project I'm going to explain is Epcot, um, Walt Disney's project for Disneyland, and how he envisioned the construction of a whole new world where he could design what happy people would do. So the experiment of the closed world becomes a control city in Walt Disney's dream project, Epcot, an abbreviation for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Epcot was a controlled, sanitized, and protected circular city, providing not only a new theme park of entertainment and leisure, but also new living patterns for happy dwellers. Disney really believed that happiness could be designed through technology, and more specifically, if we could regulate pollution, trash, ventilation, and electricity to offer leisure and comfort that he would render happy dwellers. This kind of ideal offered a very uncomplicated and wholesome sense of entertainment inside Disney's pre-engineered fantasy, an idea which is as much a closed world as the physical city that he conceived and designed himself. Epcot has been largely critiqued for subsuming the history of utopia from Claude Nicolas Ledoux to Ebenezer Howard, from the American City Beautiful movement of the 1890s to Victor Gruen's urban models, along with the added benefits of improving air quality and weather comfort. It was a living laboratory and a technology showroom for future cities, just when cities throughout the world were decaying and disintegrating. In Epcot, each house had its own fuel cells and was connected to a centralized waste collection system, water supply, and living farm using swamp plants and filtering plants. The city was also connected via a monorail running through the center and tying all parts of the property. But most importantly, the center was meant to be enclosed in a climate-controlled dome. This is something that uh, Disney saw from Bucky Fuller and copied it directly on his plant for the center of Epcot. Disney overall has been largely critiqued by architectural and cultural critics for his earnest belief in controlling human emotions through the sovereignty of territory and in the pursuit of happiness as a game of managing comfort and human physiology. And this is another critique the Mickey Mouse as the Great Dictator uh, by Royston Landau, um, who was teaching at that time at the Architectural Association of London and was understanding and trying to write on complex urban systems. So Disney's perception, Disney really liked astronauts, as you see this one and this one, for example. But it, it really is beyond the kind of 
image of the bubble and the helmet that surrounds the head, the mind, the, the, the human, the existence. It mostly is about the perception of life as a feedback loop of input and output, as the process of combustion and oxidation, which was widespread in the design of the spacesuit as a life support system, um, and in the understanding of trauma following war. And this is Mickey Mouse as, as an astronaut. And this is the kind of perception of life as a feedback loop. If we think of not only the efficiencies of NASA describing feedback loop, but the understanding of trauma following the war, we can recall the words of Jewish psychiatrist and neurologist Viktor Frankl in his best-selling book, Man's Search for Meaning, that was written after his stay at a Nazi concentration camp. And he argued that the difference between those who had lived and those who had died came down to one thing, their ability to find meaning in the most trivial, repetitive, and mechanical tasks of life. In his own words, happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and could in fact ensue, from the meaning of sustaining life through a series of problem-solving challenges. Similarly, a problem-solving challenge was how to handle all the waste in that city and hide it. And he, Disney invented a system called the Utilidor, which were basically underground channels um, that would handle all, all of waste management. Network of tunnels contained a series of systems to handle waste that the park produced in an entirely circular closed system. This system was actually implemented not only at Disneyland, but also at Roosevelt Island, where all trash is regulated with pneumatic tubes in the underground and is forced through air pumps to the end of the island to be collected and picked up. <coughs> but this project also reveals the problem of what I call the problem of the arrow. It is this idealization of the idea of circularity which reveals a deeply rooted problem of deduction in environmental representation, which is visualized almost exclusively through the use of arrows. And this is the diagram that was used to handle waste uh, below the ground um, and hide it. Since the 1960s, ecologist Howard Odom's energy systems language, called Energes, has instrumentalized ecosystems as well as human agency in terms of input and output. This representation language for ecological simulation models, derivative from electronic circuits, has become the primary tool for architects to visualize performance and energy flow. Arrows, though, however legible, they remove a type of drawing agency that is critical to our field. Could alternative notation systems and fields reflect effectively replace arrows, given that arrows point only to the end goal of conversions, but say very little about the process of recycling itself. The Chilean biologist Francisco Varela argued that cognitive systems cannot be understood explicitly on the basis of their input and output relationships, but by their operational closure. Thus, the language of environmental representation represents a process of interlinked threads while these threads and processes are trying to develop a relationship with themselves. In the environment, perception is seen as a cognitive process of hypothesis formation, not as a single prescription or reflection of pre-given information. A closed world, therefore, along with its dwellers, is a new type of unbalanced ecosystemic model susceptible to the shortcomings of digestion what remains a paradox is the manner in which this questionable model, imbued with the vitalism of a digestive stomach, has prevailed as the mainstream model of what we now call a sustainable net zero habitat opposing energy loss. In this light, it is critical to question to what degree resource conservation strategies are sustainable forms of practice, and also recognize how impossible ideas become institutionalized through a series of bureaucratic mechanisms that are eventually labeled as eco-friendly or even worse, as green. 
So how does one write a nonlinear history? The same question. One way that I have attempted to do that was to further this research, not just through documents and reports, but through different forms and mediums. So I've showed you the archival research, the kind of documents that I have recovered for each case study. But the work was also an exhibition, an online lexicon that you can find, a website, a number of courses, and a conference. This is one instance of the first substantiation of the exhibition in New York City at the Storefront for Art and Architecture, where each project becomes a cylinder, a kind of closed world. Uh, but they're all at the same time chronologically outlined with leaflets that one can pick up. And there's another medium, a virtual reality component, that becomes an alternative expression of that medium. This is the same instance of the exhibition. Um, and this is the kind of virtual reality medium where, you know, for each project that I have analyzed in words, uh, one could also see an experience or live an experience in virtual reality. This is a second iteration of the exhibition in Los Angeles at the Wuho Gallery um, in Hollywood. And this is um, the final iteration in Sydney, Australia, that you see here, and a kind of virtual reality experience. And of course, every book has byproducts, and this, you know, this was a kind of section of the book that I called minor histories. So all the kind of speculations that could not be in that could not be integrated within the forty three prototypes that I have analyzed uh, were minor histories of human figures that were constructed inside closed worlds. So these are human figures that architects and designers have. There's a certain type, engineering a human is also part of the project. It's not just the project, it's the interlinking of the, the inhabitant, the guinea pig, and the space. So these are the human figures. These white boxes are uh, the history of environmental technology in policy and law um, related to closed systems. So when was, let's say, Azrahe founded? When was LEED founded? Um, what are all the kind of ways in which speculations were institutionalized or manifest in law? And these are projects that are not real. They're ideas. They're metaphors. Um, they weren't built. So this is Bucky Fuller's dome. Uh, Rainer Banham's environmental bubble here. Um, this, what I showed you before, the kind of bottle, which is representative of an idea. Um, these are the humans. I actually made them into pillows, um, which was kind of fun. And this is the lexicon, another, another kind of byproduct of this project. All the words that I found um, while investigating the subject that were, let's say, not unknown words for architects, but necessarily have not just a scientific and technical dimension, but also reveal synthetical processes that could be useful for architects. So the idea of acclimatization is an interesting idea. It means how a body can be prepared to go live in another environment um, and um, how this is something that's very real, actually. Athletes, when they have to go um, and compete in different climatic regions, um, they have to enter these facilities that are built by very specific architectural practices um, that ac to acclimatize themselves and, and their uh, indicators, their key performance indicators, to different kinds of environmental conditions and different, let's say, levels of moisture, wetness, um, and so forth. So in general, while I work on any project that I write about, I'm compelled to pursue different modes of research, including historical archive, archival surveys, combined with technical reports, data management, investigations of, inv of alternative formats of representation, lexicons, and databases. Diversity is absolutely critical to my work, not only in the analysis of each project's content, but also in the forms of dissemination and display. In closed worlds, I have been largely motivated to pursue different modes of research, including archive, archival surveys, 
net zero diagrams based on technical reports uh, towards the production of different mediums of display that present ideas in a way so that they are inhabited rather than they are viewed in distance. The question is how not only we display information, but how we inhabit it and make it intimate to our existence. A tentative term that I use to describe my research in a broader context is the use of history machines and mediums of immersive scholarship. In many projects, I examine, redesign, and reimagine archives. I see them not as objects that stay still and contain something, but as immersive living collections where ideas travel like we do in time and in space, mentally and physically. So the question I would like to leave you with is whether this is a deviant story of architectural history. And I believe it is not. In many ways, one critique that I've received in this book is that a closed world is like a death wish of the design object. This was in a review in Metropolis magazine by Mimi Zeiger, who wrote that any of the projects presented represented feats of science, engineering, and technology, with architecture merely playing a part. And it is true that in many projects, closed worlds manifest a kind of death wish of the design object. Yet architecture is not replaced altogether with science and engineering. It is displaced temporarily from a field that shapes the use and form of the physical world to a sensorial immersive environment that copies and simulates the metabolism and experiential aptitudes of the natural world. So far, the role of building technology has been to insulate spaces from environmental flows. This methods, what we have done from the 18th century to from the ancient times of today, is suggest through building a moral discipline that protects buildings against disease, transferring an ideological framework of religion and ethics to the micro-realm of materials. Nevertheless, in a new reality, inundated with sudden climatic changes, methane gas clouds, and ocean oceanic islands of decomposed debris, a new role is cast to the notion of environment. Instead of it being the inactive, static, and historicized context in which an architectural object is placed, the environment quite literally has become the object of design itself. It is also not a deviant story because closed worlds reflect the idea of a modern human subject which is immersed in a carefully curated replication or reverberation of the world as a pre-engineered fantasy. Inside, the unimaginable amount of information that we encounter daily in our lives through social media the only way to navigate is relative to oneself, or as French philosopher Quentin Meillessou has put it, in a relational loss with context. Our need for embeddedness in the world and the ecosystem might already be obsolete. In psychoanalysis, this idea of closure corresponds to an ontogenetic and phylogenetic stage of development, the stage of, our, of the protopsyche, at which an organism has control on nothing except for itself, denying environmental input as well as discharging output. In some ways, a subject becomes its own self-referential reality. So in this new way, in this new world, we are in dire need of a new kind of criticism and new ways to fathom with emerging types of interiorization. Either they are for subjects or spaces or urban environments and methods to break barriers in the way that we narrate stories through the design of our environments as well as the shaping of our reality. If every bit of fact through social media is designed in the world of post-truth, the role of the architect, albeit unwittingly, has expanded to more than shaping the physical world and the aesthetic and experiential aptitudes of our daily existence. In many ways, it has become of civilizational value. So we need to investigate, monitor, and document the strangeness of the real. To invent an architecture completely devoted to the problems of the real, but not one that is unaware of its uncertainty and complexity. Shit engulfs our existence in more ways than we want to observe and acknowledge. It is not about constructing fictions and fantasies, but about closely observing 
conducting forensic analysis, asking questions, and instrumentalizing our findings in a creative way. Possibly shit is our only way out. Thank you. Time for questions. Try to find the microphone as well. Yes, very Hi. Hello. So, mm, the main examples you gave about the close to earth projects uh, were from quite far from history, at least decades ago. So I'm wondering if you can also say a few words about the current state and the near future state of the closed world experiments, because I would assume that it is very uh, kind of important nowadays when the space yeah. travel is becoming real and, and the ecosystem approach is more and more popular and so on. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I actually, it's, I, you're right. I did show project of the 60s and 70s. Um, but the book does go up until 2008. Um, I think the last project is uh, Mazdar City. But um, it is really, uh, so it goes through the entire 20th century to explain that what, let's say, the Amazon spheres, I don't know if you know that project in downtown Seattle, the headquarters of Amazon that created these jungles inside to augment the productivity of workers, the, the headquarters of Google, this idea, the spaceship lives on Earth in, in a way, uh, not only through these massive corporate projects that create a kind of world that you don't want to leave, that there's nothing for you outside, basically, but also in the way that, um, you know, there are, architecture is also a medium of reconstructing pre-engineered fantasies. Um, like in China, there are these giant malls that have oceans, uh, and not only in China, I think you can, they're in Germany, th th there are plenty of them. And, um, and I have a list, uh, the ski center in Dubai. So it really becomes, uh, you know, the mall is no longer a place to shop. It's not just about consumption. Consumption has expanded to something much more um, uh, general. It, it, it contains a whole kind of like selling a way of life. And I'm extremely critical about that. Uh, but it does uh, bring to question, what is our role as architects? Do we just make these spaces? Do we critique them and not make them? Uh, do we make them in such a way to, uh, to counter certain effects? Um, and they really come from a very long history and genealogy, and I guess that was my point. But, uh, but it definitely is, to me, an extremely current question. It's not a historical question. The fact that I've showed historical examples is just to kind of narrate the history of ideas and how they potentially have unfolded. Thanks. Thanks so much. It's very interesting. But uh, I would ask a kind of tricky question, if possible. So does the planet Earth can be considered as a closed world? Well, um, that's that's a question that has been asked over and over again in the 20th century. And the canonical answer that um, scientists would give you is that the Earth is both a closed and open system. It's open in terms of energy and closed in terms of materials, right? Materials cannot leave. They can't go anywhere. But we receive energy and export energy um, to space. So um, I, that's, that's the canonical answer. Um, I think that um, one, relative to, to your question, um, one thing that I would like through this research to examine and possibly um, kind of uh, display is that we have, that, that, that it's a fantasy that we're anthropomorphizing the planet, that we're projecting a natural organism to the planet and back to technical systems. And um, this is not just something that I'm saying. I was at a conference, actually, at Biosphere 2 in Arizona. It was a NASA-orchestrated conference. And from different disciplines, people, people are saying that how the kind of transposition of, um, of 
add of features to, to the Earth has been problematic in the development of, of several scientific fields. So I, I can't speak for the Earth because I'm an architect. And I mean, maybe Buckminster Fuller, John McHale, they considered their project the design of the planet, planetary housekeeping. Uh, but, um, but I don't think that I have the, the kind of skill set to understand exactly how to understand the planet. But definitely, it's not a closed system, no. It's, um, it's, it looks like one, <laughs> but it's not. Maybe a short one. If you are creating such kind of closed world, as an architect of the whole the project. No, I don't agree. No, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah. I, it's the beginning of the other question. I'm, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not reflecting. The, so I would like to uh, ask about this um, aspect in data information. You have the world in this adjustment regulation of this aspect. Uh, in any case, are there any cases when this, this whole project is focused on data and information? exchange if we close this system. Oh, not materials, you mean? Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's a very good question. Absolutely, yes. Um, and in the book, I have um, spoken also of um, information closure, feedback loops, um, robotic systems, um, feedback, um, experiments on feedback, cognition. Um, so it is something that um, that is very, very important as well. And I mean, in the end, I was trying to convey, maybe not so, maybe I need more words to do that, but I was trying to convey how the kind of handling of the way that we understand the world through social media and um, echo chambers, the idea that um, the information that we receive is a reverberation of our own voices in many ways, because we only receive things that we like. Um, we don't encounter otherness. We don't encounter things that are different from, from us, mostly. And, um, and I think, in a way, that's why I was talking about the, the subject as, as a type of, of, of closed system through the way that information is curated and creating a very kind of explicit understanding of, of the world itself. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I'm wondering if the statement that the closed world is sort of a death wish of a design object. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm wondering what should be the what should be then the architect's part of working in 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 those topics. I mean, we know that mm -hmm. Pierre Ganga's group group is working on on Mars projects, or Elon Musk is constantly. Uh, involving designers to to develop the um, the spaceships or um, or whatever other features. So I'm wondering what should be the architect's part of of in in in, in this kind of um, and conditions. Is it just designing the system where where then the life takes part, or is it actually like specific things that we should tackle? Like for example, with with your studios that you're teaching what what is the architect's job in in designing the, the futures of those those environments yeah i <laughs> that's a really good question because there's not one answer to it um i i don't think that it should be the death wish of a design object but in in some cases there's a very big gap between the engineering flowchart which is the understanding of a system seen through the eyes of a canonical representation system for the engineers, and the way that architects are or have been humanists um, and understand um, formal organization, mostly. And this was a traditional battle in NASA when they were designing space settlements in the 60s. But right now, our, our profession has expanded so dramatically and so largely through information modeling systems, through large data streams that, that we need to handle. And our perception of the environments has expanded in so many ways that I don't think it's such a clear dichotomy of the engineer saying design a system or design an object, right? I think that um, I'm certainly a fan of formal organization myself. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing that. Um, I think there is a formal organization not so much attentive to the, to the system, because that would be 
um, a kind of new performative ethos, right, that transfers the kind of logic of, of modernism of form follows function to performance follows function. And that's not something that, I, that I'm interested in either. But I think that all of these things, all of these environments are designed places right now. And we need to account for them and design them and not just focus on our canonical understanding of the discipline. I think we need very well to know how to design a space, not just as a kind of physical barrier, but understand climatic conditions, humidities, what goes in, what goes out, um, how one th something that goes out can feed into another thing. Um, what is the effect, the footprint of something in a larger metropolitan area? If there is a methane cloud of, of shit, that it's important to reflect that somehow in the typology and design of, of a building. So it is, it is not so much a dichotomy as, as much as a, let's say, enlarged awareness of, of what we can, we can do. Same person. Yeah, if nobody else wants. Um, That's OK. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about uh, when you're doing this, well, this is a very interesting topic, and you are doing a lot of research about the, about the history and producing archive and curating the information in various ways and presenting it in various ways. And I'm just wondering, when doing so, do you have some conscious position from which you approach this topic, it does not seem to be just uh, uh, neutral, unbiased uh, historian or, or scient scientist position. It's, it seems to be more like um, an active, I don't know, criticizing position or, or just trying yeah. to point out the um, problematic points. Or do you have some conscious position from which you approach it? Yes, um, I'm interested in how entirely different typologies of projects, you know, like military projects that had to do with colonialism and countercultural projects for, you know, people that wanted to live off the grid are governed by the same principles entirely and how that manifests and how one is one group is entirely critical of the other, and still the operational abstract principles in both cases are, are the same. And I'm also interested, so failure is, uh, not, that's not a failure, that's, that's a kind of lack of a broader landscape in which you know, these abstract principles unfold and take place historically. Uh, but, but I think that it's, it's very interesting to think of this problem as our existential desire to persist to design these types of places while we know they fail, and why we do that. Like, why do we design a new biome in the desert for us to ski on? And um, why is comfort so important that we have to spend 90% of, 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 of energy intake to position comfort? I mean, wear a jacket or, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's very simple what I'm saying, but, but why don't we encounter something that's not the instant fulfillment of our desires? Um, so I, I do have a critical position. I, I'm interested in how um, similar, so how projects that are you know, governed by similar abstract operational principles are representing entirely different political desires, agendas, existential positions about where we are and where we, we might go. And, and I guess this is too much, but I was trying to display the complexity of this uh, narrative. Great, thanks. <laughs> there, there are two people that, uh, that, that only these two people have questions, yes. <laughs> Same people, but maybe Oh, okay, okay. A third person might have a question. Okay. Then ask. Then ask. So I understood. Uh, I'm trying to understand the subject for myself. So okay. that's what I'm asking. So I understood that uh, closed doesn't mean closed system, doesn't mean isolated system, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. So, second. Yes. Thing. So, for example, this is, I mean, I, 
it depends, right? Yeah. That's how how I'm, I'm. I can tell you how I define closed. If you if you think of a scientist like in a petri dish that investigates an ant colony to be closed, it has to be entirely sealed. But for me, because we're architects, and you know, no system can be entirely closed by everything, right? Only the biosphere was entirely closed, and it failed. Um, I took. Um, certain flows of energy like water, solid waste, uh, power, um, and, and air, and some systems were, um, and information and data, and so, some systems were closed on one level, but not on all. So there were some projects that were closed, I can show you actually, um, only on data, but not, okay, this is a, a little bit confusing, so I'll, I'll just do this. In, in other remarks, it's also possible that uh, actually closed system starts consuming environment more aggressively, comparing to- In more, a what? More aggressively, can start consuming Aggressive? environment, yeah, more aggressively, aggressively yeah. than- So these lines that you see here, like these lines in the timeline, this means something, it's a, it's a color coding. This is solid waste. And this is production and consumption. So this is how much solid waste this building produces and how much it consumes. So it spits out that, but it's taking care of that. So it almost evens itself out. But this, uh, it's missing yellow, right? So it doesn't generate power. So it's just closure in terms of like certain, certain aspects. And this is typology shape. This is typology. So there's a whole diagram in the book about it on taxonomizing. But closure is, you know, for this project is just about air, nothing else. See, we are talking, we were talking mostly about like artificial closed systems, and social, social technical, technological like systems. But artificial? Uh, like uh, I mean, artificial created by humans. But yeah. my, my question would be, uh, there are some examples, but what are good examples of natural closed systems? Oh. Are, are there any natural uh, colonies? Oh yeah, I mean ant colonies. They build col ants build colonies, and they they gather together, and they form a perimeter, and they put they make. I mean, these scientists, like if you talk, to, it's, you you can get crazy things like in nature. Ants like make mounds of their poo, and they make a circle around it, and they move like little parts of it, and then they go to another mound, and they move the mounds. And they, th you know, a lot of a lot of species do that. A lot of species, you know, internalize their structure and their colonies and have like, you know, internal orders. I, I, at the beginning, I, I like this like uh, the idea of this and uh, mentioning ants, but I don't like uh, as example because ants are moving in the forest around. You know, it's not so close. I mean, even like uh, visually, it's to not bring close. food. No, exactly. But where they live, is, is you don't do that. <laughs> after that. Is, is it really closed one, the system, if they are just moving You around? mean like a species that doesn't go out of a place? Yeah, m m more, more like, uh, like resembles. Well, of... They all have to go like somewhere to survive. I, I mean, I don't know if this is even helpful or useful, um, but, um, but they all create their own like substructural systems and not all. A lot of, a lot of animals, a lot of organisms do that. Basically, we can learn from natural from nature. In yeah, this. yeah, absolutely. There, are, there are natural systems that can do that. Thanks. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lydia, so much for the lecture. <laughs> Thank you. I will stop here and let's continue tomorrow because I know that we have master degree students who are touching. A bit same questions. Okay, so. okay. I look forward so thank to you so much. It. Thank you. And Thanks happy holiday me. for everybody. Thank you.